And I now want to introduce uh, our speaker at the very far end of the table, Sibir Shiki, who is an Iranian German filmmaker, writer, and political activist, author of the international bestseller, Afghanistan, Where God Only Comes to Weep, which won uh, the Penn Prize. Yay. <laughs> well Thank done. Thank you very much for organizing all of this. It's really her cool work that you have done there. Thank you to everyone who has helped you and also the people who have funded and given the sources. Next time, please give the speakers more time and please make it possible that we discuss. I have heard so many things here that I think, no, that's wrong, or where I think I would like to add something to it or change something, especially, for example, at this table, Huria. We have so different opinions about so many things that you said. Afghanistan was a country where 90% of the people were illiterate. How can you say it was a free country? My God, yeah? Okay, no, let's, not, let's, not, let's not discuss it now because because we don't have time to discuss and it's going off my time. But one thing that I also have to say is, you said no one did anything when the Mujahideen fought. No one did anything when the Taliban came. It's not true. We were a hundred people in Kabul, for example, during the time of the Taliban who risked their lives. We have nothing to do with Afghanistan otherwise. We organized secret home schools. We organized teachers. We organized guards. In the middle of the night, we would go through Kabul with the Taliban patrolling and we would organize secret home schools so that kids and women would go get education. No one did anything. No one said anything. It's not true. I was just introduced with my best-selling book, Afghanistan, Where God Only Comes to Weep. I got a pen prize for it. It was written and researched in that time. Many people did many things, and I'm the proof of it. Okay, but now, to the, what I came here for, to what I wanted to say. Ah, I am the daughter of a Christian mother, the daughter of a... Baha'i father, that's a religion that came up in Iran 180 years ago, maybe. Um, in in uh, Iran, I was born and raised. Therefore, of course, I was born and raised in a Muslim society with um, Zoro Zoroastrian past. Eid in Oruz is still something that we celebrate. The fire, the sun are still holy to us. Although people are Muslims, they still find um, the sun and the, and the fire holy. And um, we had a lot of Jewish friends and we would celebrate Shabbat with them. Even if simply they couldn't turn on the gas stove during Shabbat, we would go to turn it on for them. And we, I, I grew up dancing and singing to Evan Yushalom Aleichem, Evan Yushalom Aleichem. And so I had to learn five religions, and I literally went to classes to learn it, not just by saying and people telling me. I had to, Fridays was the Baha'i class. I hated it because my Friday was ruined, but I had to go to the class. So what's the outcome? Me. And no one ever told me anything about any religion being bad except the religions within the Baha'i would say, but the Muslims are like this, the Christians would say, but the Jews are like that, the Jews would say, but the, ba the Zoroastrian is already gone, and so forth. So, and still, I became what I am. Why? Because I had education. Something happened during that time and now. One, because I have education, I got education. Um, I found things that I love. Very, 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 very important message here. I found things that I love. I love telling stories. I love writing books. I love making films. As soon as you find the thing that the people who you work with love, you have always rescued them, already rescued them. You don't have to tell them, this is not good, that is good, this is... Just give them an occupation, give them something that they love or, or activate what they love. 
they have it. You just have to find it and activate it. And they already, um, they already are saved from wrong beliefs. Um, I don't think that religion itself it's, is so much the problem and the target that we have to target let me find someone who's religious and I will fight him and then we, are, we, we will have a, an in, increase of secularism in the world. No, I think that the problem is really this, that we do not, um, that so many kids these days don't have something that they're passionately burned for. 15,000 youths of other countries, which is half of what we know as ISIS today, come from other countries, from here, Great Britain, from Germany, from France, from America, from Australia, Turkey, etc. What happened to these kids? Why did they, why did they, are, are they being attracted by an idea that's called ISIS killing people, being strong, being macho, because they don't have anything else that they love, that they are passionate for? And I believe in action. And I, because we have so little time, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to once more repeat what we all know, what is going on. And we have Google, we can Google what is going on in different countries. I don't have to tell you. Let's talk about what we can do. And I think this is something that we can do. Um, I, 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 like to, I like to tell you a few things very short about what I experienced in Afghanistan um, because I think that those are very good examples for what we can do. For example, we, I, I, I uh, was chosen to ask and I said immediately, I said yes, um, to be political advisor to NATO from um, 2001 to 2006, I stopped being it after they brought in the tornadoes and turned the peace mission clearly into a war mission. I stopped doing that and only help out when there is case of emergency now, when there is a life threatened, somebody being taken hostage or something like that. Um, but when I used to be when I used to be on the field with them, um, the NATO soldiers would do the same mistake that the Americans did, that the Russians did, that everybody did, even NGOs who went to Afghanistan or countries like Afghanistan do the same mistake. They go to a village, remote village, some of the villages we cannot reach in Afghanistan, Huria knows, um, we have to climb a horse and then uh, go a very dangerous path and sometimes we even have to get off the horse because the horses slide and then you look down and it's like, oh, you don't see the end of the valley. So, and they go there and they say, who's the elder in this village? You know what I want to tell you, right? The elder in the village is usually a bearded man. Man, always a man, never a woman. And um, usually a religious person and they get one minute, no way. And they get, um, they get another attention from the people coming in, another time attention from the people coming in gets more powerful and so forth. Instead of, we did what we did, I'm very proud of this, a friend of mine and myself, we generated money, went to Kabul to a, one of the homeschools that we had built up during the time of the Mojahedin and one that we had built up during the times of the Taliban. And we said to the women, so we have this chunk of money, what do we do? And they immediately agreed we built a women's center that then became a, a community center. And my friend and I had one condition, we are not going to employ a company to do it because we don't have any money, uh, no, not enough money, that is one reason. But the second reason is we want the people who use the center to build it up themselves, which is mainly women and children. So we had talks, weeks of, and weeks and weeks of talks with the women and their families. And in the end, now I'm making a very long story, very short, in the end, it was women building this center, women in Afghanistan building the center. In the beginning, they were sitting like this, but my husband won't give me permission. In the end, they were like, like, hello, my friend. They gave me, they shake me the hand like this, and they were like walking like me, bullying and so forth. Eight of them became carpenters. The carpenter in the, in the region employed them. They go to women's houses and 
built windows for women who are living alone and who don't have permission to let men carpenters to come in the house. They built a kindergarten where, I don't know, 200 kids go there. They came one day and said, we have a good idea. We want to build an oven and we will do a pottery. They do a candle um, production and so forth. So empowering these women um, and their children um, led to the, to the result that the men, um, first of all, understood, saw that women are capable of doing things, and second, no one in that community had time to think of any religion or any, um, but Allah said this and Muhammad said that and women are this and nobody. On the contrary, on the other side of this little alley where we had our center, there was a mosque. After a couple of weeks, the mullah came over and said, I want to speak to your boss. I said, we have no boss. He said, yeah, thank you. He said, um, okay, who's responsible? He said, we are all responsible. I have to talk to a woman? No, not to one woman. You have to talk to a lot of women. <laughs> anyway, he sat down, we talked, and he said, the, one of the women said, so what do you want? He said, this house became too pretty. Now my mosque looks so dirty and small next to it. Can you come and paint it for me? We said, yeah, we have women who can come and paint it and this is the price. And said, you want money for it, for a mosque? Yes, of course we want money for it. Anyway, we painted that mosque too. Um, I think what I want to say, and I'll finish um, right away, um, in Zaatari, there is also some, we, we made a small clip, I was in Zaatari, the, it is the second biggest camp, refugee camp in the world now, in Jordan, 85,000 people live there, um, they have a street which they have built, where they have built shops, they call it Champs-Élysées, and they have a nightclub there, of course women are being prostituted there, um, there, there would be so many things I would like to talk about, Mariam, next time please more time, um, and Sorry, but it is not true that when a woman is being raped there or when kids are being sold there, nobody does anything. Yes, people do something. In the camp itself, people have org built organization, little units, where they pr protect each other, women protect each other and so forth. Um, ah, I want to remind of Kaklash Sajjarti and Malala, who got the Nobel Peace Prize, who are nominated, for, uh, no, not nominated, announced the next Nobel Peace Prize winners. I, I am a believer of telling the positive stories and the things that we have achieved instead of reminding one more time of the things that we have not achieved. Please look into epigenetics, which is what the what the brain does with the things that our parents have experienced. Google it, epigenetics, very, very important for your work when you are, if you are activists. I would like to encourage you not to use, please, because we're in London, I can say it, the term uh, Near East, Middle East, Far East, of what? Of the center of the world, which is London? Come on, guys. At least please refrain from using colonial terms when you speak of freedom and liberty. Okay, thank you very much. And last not least, <laughs> last, last not least, please, Mariam John, in the end of the conference, let us um, vote for something that, that, that we give out as a result. Um, so that we don't go into history as a conference that has one more time um, recalled and, and reminded of the things that go wrong in the world, but of something that we want to do. And please let's meet next year again. Thank you very much.